we're just the most fundamentally sound team in the industry. That's the only thing I want to be fundamentally sound. And a lot of the meetings is just running the same play, right? Just doing the same thing again and again and again. But we do it in a way that's high, very high pace, fun. We have extremely high standard. We hold other people accountable. So welcome back, everybody, to another amazing episode of the Everything is Influence podcast, where in on each and every episode, we take an amazing individual and break down their process of influence. And as always, we're going to start out with what are they up to in the world? How do they see the process of influence? And how have they done that at scale to replace themselves, their influence, their mission, and their values into people and process to make a difference in the world? We're going to scale back to level one influence. How do they influence themselves? What have been some of their challenges? How have they gotten over it? And how have they taken the clarity and certainty they have in their own life and their own process? And how have they begin to transfer that to another human being? And it is a really special episode here because I've been in sales for a really long time. And I got to coach a company a couple of years ago. And I saw this dude uh, who was doing well in that organization. And we knew he was a stud, but little did we know that he was this much of a stud because he has made a bigger impact on the high ticket sailing world than literally anyone. And the biggest seven, eight, and nine figure teams seek out this one man for advice. He's made a big impact on my life, how I sell, and I think he's raised the entire bar, the standard for the entire industry. So without any further ado, Mr. Cole Gordon, how are you? Thanks, man. That was great. That was the best podcast intro I've had. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That's what I do. That's what I do, man. That's, that's what we do here. Uh, that's it. So, you know, um, I do want to start off with just to get people here that aren't familiar with you. Um, like, what are you up to in the world now? What is your company? What do you do? Yeah. So just starting with where we're at now, I mean, I own Closers.io. So Closers.io is kind of a, a holding company with uh, two brands under it. The first brand, and that was the first company I started is Sales Team Accelerator. So that's basically helping uh, people in high ticket services. So that could be coaching, consulting courses, um, masterminds, or even um, agency services, professional services, anything that's really $3,000 or more working with SaaS companies now too, a little bit, uh, if they have product market fit, it's helping those companies recruit, hire, manage, and train their sales teams. And we do it with basically, we have a done for you staffing element where we place sales reps inside of their business. But it's all about building the team internally with their company. So we're kind of known, you know, when I came into the industry with uh, Sales to Accelerator, you know, there wasn't really any models kind of like ours. Uh, a lot of people were either um, just teaching it or they were uh, really not a lot of people were teaching it. It's mainly people just doing pure done for you, like they had a done for you agency. And there's nothing wrong with that model, but my personal thesis and belief on how to scale a sales team properly based on the sales teams that was on in the past is that you need to build it internal for so many different reasons. Uh, I think the one, the biggest one is culture and buy-in from your salespeople. So I really always believed that you have to build an internal team. That is the way to do it. So kind of what I created fit that thesis. And it's basically helping staff the uh, salespeople in those companies and then tra help, you know, helping the founders train them up in the KPI, even helping train the sales reps themselves in the KPI, and then helping the founders be better leaders so they can influence the salespeople to be the best versions of themselves. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's really where the go to when it comes to people who are like, I'm finally ready to build my internal team or I'm finally ready to delegate my sales calls. So that's that company. And then uh, a little bit newer company, it's probably 13 months, 12 months since we started it, 13 months probably, is Remote Closing Academy, which is basically a certification that helps, um, you know, somebody who wants to get into sales. Right. If you're trying to get into sales. It's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. Or if you want a really good position, well, the good companies, they want somebody with experience. But if you're trying to get in, you don't have experience. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of bridging that gap between those two people. And it's also with, you know, the Make Money Online community, there's a lot of like stuff out there that's, you know, Amazon and dropshipping. And there's nothing wrong with those. But you're, you're having to build this big thing and learn all of these different skills to be able to make some money online with your nine to five. So it's a, it's a much easier way for somebody who is not fulfilled in their career to get to 10 or 20K a month online, uh, doing one thing, just mastering one skill and solving a problem for companies that they really need. So we, we bring those people up and a lot of times if, they, if they're really good or they have existing experience, they'll go right into a closing role. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes we'll go into an entry level role uh, where they'll build themselves up and they, they tend to do extremely well uh, in like a center role. And then a lot of them, like we've got guys 
started a center, moved to a closer, and now they're the sales director of a, of a big company. And, you know, before they were a musician, you know, so it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool, but they're still committed because they invest in themselves and they go through some great training, of course, and some mentorship and stuff like that. So those are the two companies. And obviously there's a, there's a flywheel, uh, what's it called? Not flywheel, network effect mm -hmm. from it to where, you know, the more we got over here, the more we got over here, the kind of the better they both do. And so they kind of grow one, one will grow a bunch and then the other one will grow and then the other one will grow. So yeah. Little competition. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, I, I want to dig into so much with you here that I think can help our folks out. Most people listening are entrepreneurs, they're coaches, they're salespeople looking for a gig. They have a gig. They're looking to build a team. Um, and as we look at this highest level of influence, um, you're like a quadruple threat. You can sell uh, your copy is great. Your ads are great. But not only have you mastered this skill, not because uh, you're just reading scripts, you understand the process of influence, of, of psychology, of framing. And so that's bled not only into your actual sales, but into your leadership. And I know a lot of people, obviously, I know majority of your staff, like the main people that have been there, and they've worked for other companies. Uh, I met you at another company, and they all say that you are the best leader they've ever worked for. And you mentioned culture a lot. And for folks that are listening here, a lot of you probably have a sales team. You're looking to bring on a salesperson. Um, you mentioned culture. How important is that? Because you've got a great one. And with Sales Team Accelerator, you help people build their own culture. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll tell you. How does somebody do that? I'm, I'm going to tell you a counterintuitive way to build culture. So okay. I bet you've never heard this. Yeah. Right. So um, here's the thing. So the remote, everybody would agree, you know, any, I, I, I guarantee I could take some guy who works a desk job off the street and doesn't even know what I, you know, what I do. If I ask him, you know, is, for a high performing sales team, is sales culture really important? I think you could just ask everybody, 99% of the world, even if they're not entrepreneurial, even if they're, you know, a secretary somewhere, they'd probably be like, oh, of course it's important. They think of the sales teams, they think of the movies, Wolf of Wall Street, whatever culture is important, right? And it is. Right, so we can all agree upon culture with sales teams being important. Yeah. Um, here's the thing, though: if you know now with how things have shifted, there's a you know we're no we're no for remote sales teams. We can, we can help somebody in person, like I've done that. I think it's harder to do remote. So if you could do remote, you can definitely do it in person. Um, so with a remote team, it's harder to do remote. Harder to do remote sales. Yeah. Well, for, Yes, but we'll, we'll we, we can start. That's a different thread, but we can go back to it. So, in, in general, it's hard to build culture in a remote team, right? Yeah. Well, if you're a remote team, what are the culture can only be built when two people or more from an organization, whether that a business or a nonprofit or whatever organization, could be a political organization, whatever, two people or more are together. Okay, culture can only be built when two people or more are together. Yep. Okay. Well, if you run a remote organization, when is the only time that can happen? Meetings, mm. right? Therefore, the quality of your meetings are the quality of your culture. So when people are thinking about trying to create a great culture, they should really be asking themselves, how do they run great meetings? And the number one thing you'll hear from people in my company is, this was kind of weird when I, I did not engineer this this way. I just noticed this. As people would be like, I love, I, I, they're like, I've never had this before, but I love the meetings here. I love the meetings. And uh, it's interesting because we have fun on the meetings, but they're extremely fast paced to the point. We get a lot of done. We train. I mean, it's the same thing as like a football team. Uh, we train every single time. Right. So if like you probably watch an Alabama practice, they're probably not doing a bunch of fancy stuff. They're probably running the same five to 15 plays. Mm -hmm. every single practice multiple times again and again and again and again right like i uh, i played on a team in high school and literally we ran three plays three three plays so the practices were just running the damn plays again and again and again and the coaches of those teams want to stay championship with the team they're coaching for wow. running those three plays so again that's kind of like the sales team man we don't do anything fancy we're just the most fundamentally sound team in the industry that's the only thing i want to be fundamentally sound and a lot of the meetings is just running the same play, right? Just doing the same thing again and again and again. But we do it in a way that's high, very high pace, fun. We have extremely high standard. We hold other people accountable. So people respect you as a leader when, um, like if somebody acts out of line with the values or they're not holding up to the standard of the company 
and they're not being addressed on a meeting, the rest of the team will lose respect for the leader and the bar will naturally lower. Right. So, so part of like, and this is just kind of naturally instinctive to me at this point, but like if somebody is not being the best that they could be, or they're not up to the standard of the company, or they're not putting in a proactive, the, the best effort they could have, um, we're going to address that immediately. Mm-hmm. Right? Now I'm not going to embarrass the person. If it's going to be something where I'm really going to have a difficult conversation, you know, we can, we can do a one-on-one. Right. But I'm not going to just not say anything. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and that will garner respect and people will be like, so they're like, Man. and people just say this, you know, this is stuff we've seen, like when we've done intake forms and results and stuff that like, n- like people like, they're like, man, nobody who's not like really good can get on this team, no. you know, and it, and it builds their ego. And they're like, uh, when you see some of those breaches and standards that you call out one on, what are some of those things that you see that you look out for mm-hmm. that would be like, I don't want to say a red flag, but what are some of the things that you notice that like, all right, that needs addressing. Yeah, so, so I'll give you one really good one, is behavioral to results awareness, right? So it goes with this phrase, yeah. there's no shame in not hitting your numbers, there's only shame in not knowing why, right? So I, I will never, I will never uh, come down on somebody for not hitting their target, but I will come down on somebody for a lack of effort, or if they don't hit their target and they, they're like, I'm like, why didn't you hit your target? If, if, if somebody doesn't hit their KPI, everybody in the organization, except for the operations team, because they're kind of reacting to the rest of the organization, which is that, that's not up, uh, that's the nature of that team. Mm-hmm. Everybody in the organization has a KPI. If they miss their KPI, my next question every single time is going to be, "Why did you miss?" What, like, okay, you projected five, you hit three. Why three? Why three and not five? Right? And I need to know an awareness around uh, awareness around why they didn't hit the thing they said that they were going to hit or why they're at where they're at. There needs to be behavioral to results awareness, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. So they need to, because because what's going to happen is you, you need to build this muscle of when we say we're going to do something, we're able to engineer our behavior, our leading indicators in such a way where we could do it, right? So like I call that the, I, I didn't make this one up. I heard this from somebody on Instagram one time, but it, this, the guy was calling it the say-do ratio, right? Mm-hmm. We want to align our say-do ratio as much as, you know, if we say something, we do it. That, that ratio needs to be really good. Hmm. So, uh, you know, that's the biggest thing. A lot of these things, what's nice is, you know, look, there, there might be somebody who comes into position and, and, you know, they're a great person and they're, they're a culture fit and they end up not being just good enough. And, and if they are truly a culture fit, we will try to move them into a different position. Yeah. Um, but most people who don't make it um, or don't fit in with us, it's, it's going to be, they don't either put in the effort, like they're not trying to go all out with every single thing that they're doing and trying to do it to the best of their ability and trying to maximize their potential on every single thing they're doing every single day, Mm -hmm. or they lack that behavior results awareness, right? It's a self-awareness thing. It's like, they're not hitting their numbers. They're not thoughtfully thinking about it. They don't know why they're just being weighted to like, and it's like, you'd be like told like do this and then they just, you know, go. So I would say that's, that's one of the big things is, you know, like yesterday in a marketing meeting, we, we weren't getting the results we wanted on one of the channels we were doing. So I asked why? And, 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 the, and you can tell there's not awareness in the response. Awareness would be like, yeah, well, on our Instagram, basically the last six posts we made, we only made two offers instead of six. And the content messaging was a little bit like this compared to what we were doing three weeks ago when the results were really good. So the action step I'm going to take is I'm going to revert it back to what we were doing three weeks. Right? I'm just making that up, right? But if you see this like, uh, well, like, um, I think, uh, even if I just hear like a little bit of that, I'm like, you don't know what's going on. Yeah. So it could, it could startle people and you gotta let them set into it and kind of like get, um, you gotta let them like assimilate into the culture a little bit. It's like, it's a little startling at first. Uh, but it's a gift when you can give it to somebody because man, it just empowers them to just become this high performer. Yeah. You have so many teams and so many people, account managers have all these things going on. When you manage a team like that, usually at some point in the day, like almost every day, like the chances of somebody doing something that's not hundred percent correct are pretty high, like daily. Yeah. Like, so how do you, cause you manage so many teams and you've grown so fast, faster than anybody. Um, one, like how do you manage the stress? Cause it's gotta be stressful dealing with all of that. I mean, you've grown so fast, you've systematized, you've optimized. Um, and it's, 
on the outside looking in, it seems like you're not really making any mistakes. So there's not been any big challenges, but I know that that can't be true. Yeah. So like, how do you deal with challenges? I would think about it this way, man. At the end of the day, I, I sit here and I type on the computer and I talk to people, right? So really, am I doing anything that's stressful? Am I out there swinging a sledgehammer and freaking like knocking out concrete and breaking stuff? No, like that's stressful. You know, that's actually stressing the body, right? So the stress in the business is only the, is only the because of the meaning I'm assigning to the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So if I could change the meaning, I can change my response to it. Oh, it's like you just Tony Robbins me. I know I did just Tony Robbins you. I knew you would like that one. <laughs> that's it. Change your meaning, change your life. Yeah, that's there it. you go. Yeah. I so it. I mean, that's the end of the day. And I, and I think I heard him say that, obviously, like about, about work. That always just stuck with me. Now, dude, do I get stressed some days? Yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, like I always ask, what's the worst thing that could happen? And then if you envision that scenario and play it a thousand times in your mind, it's usually not that bad. Like most things are, most things are, um, you know, we can recover from it. No. So let's, let's back up. So how did you get into sales? When I met you at TNF, Trafficking Funnels, you had done a couple jobs before selling like it. You pretty much invented the two-step. We'll get to that in a bit. I um, did. I, I feel like okay. if I say that, nobody believes me. So I, I said it. I said it. I said it. So it's okay. You know, I, I said it. Um, so let's kind, of, let's kind of back up though. It's like, yeah, because I've seen your, your, and speaking of your marketing, very consistent. I didn't know you were a bartender. I didn't know the story about the thing in your face. All You know, I know all the things now just through your marketing and I, and I know you. Uh, and so I'm seeing like the consistency in your marketing. Um, and you've, you've had so many great people that you've been around that you've learned from that you've paid as coaches, but also worked with or, and now you're coaching. So you see some of what's working in these big industries and in these big yeah. businesses. Um, but for you, how did you get into all this high ticket selling stuff? Yeah. Well, 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 short story. So, uh, grew up super awkward, like definitely not what I am now, like super, super shy and awkward and, and started to get into some personal development to get my social life and handled. So let's read some books no. and, you know, I went through some trash ones and then I, I read this one that, um, honestly it was like an ebook for like 37 bucks. It's probably when people were getting rich off ebooks and it was really good though. And um, it was just about like developing a social life in college. It was kind of like, I would read it now. I think it was so stupid, but it really, I, I like read this. It was the first personal development material I ever read. And I took action on it. I mean, I remember reading it and it was this most boring history class ever. This guy was awful. Yeah. And uh, I, it was two hours long. Too. So I sat there and I almost cranked out the book at two hours. And I stepped out of that class, literally a different person. Right. Mm -hmm. And this guy, you know, one of the things I was so shocked. You know, and this guy in this book was talking about like the overarching thesis of the book was giving love, right? And like being somebody when you walk into a room, like being a person of high energy and being a person that uplifts other people and being somebody who gives value to somebody else and being somebody where when they see you, like you're building this positive reaction towards them because like you're a person of high energy, high value, good vibes. Like that's the most simplest thing in the world. But like, dude, like that blew my mind. I was like, oh my God. So I walked out of that room and I was literally that person. I was like, and, and dude, it changed so much for me. Like it, I mean, and, and granted, I'm not saying I'm like that now. I mean, I'm probably just seem like a regular guy, but when you take an extremely introverted shy kid and like, it starts to like, Oh, oh like I'm, I'm just so focused on myself. I need to be focused on other people, be focused on like that type of thing. It, it did really make a difference in like how I was communicating to people. So um, that was the first thing where I was like, wow, I can like, change i can get better at stuff so like that was it like i, I got that little bump in my social life and i was like i was it. i was like okay well this is good now so then i i went on and i was like what if i apply the same thing to school and then so i went from this like 3.0 student and i started racking 4.0s like I literally a terrible student just started just racking and then i i started to like okay i can I get better here okay get better at fitness and then I was the broke bartender. So part of like me trying to get good at the social life too is, you know, bartending was cool. So like, that was my, I was trying to go up the status food chain and that was kind of how you did it back then. Yeah. And, and just, just, to, just to interject really quick, you know, I've seen like, even inside of your Facebook group, you create all these, this free content, great content. It's so well organized, structured, like the, the trainings you put out, the scripts, like the bajillion different ways completely scripted out to handle this one objection. Like you have just so much detail in your process of everything you've done, you know, the free content, everything. It's just really like bullet pointed out all that. Have you always been that detail oriented, organized? You know, yeah, I, I feel like I have a little bit, I'm, I feel like I'm not next 
I don't know if I'm an extrovert or not. I always test one, but I feel like I have a little bit of more of a engineering type yeah. of mindset. Yeah. yeah, a little bit more. Uh, like I was good at math, you know. Like I was like I was like the math guy. So I always like that type of stuff. So I, I do think that helped. But um, long story short, you know, when I when I was doing the bartending thing, and that's how I thought it was going to be cool. There was this one shift. It was like nobody was there. I was freaking super broke. I read this book, and after reading this book, it was like similar to that one experience I had. I realized I was trying to be a doctor and do all these things I wanted to do for totally the wrong reasons. And I just needed to be a common entrepreneur because I was, you know, I was happier then than I was the shy opera kid, but I definitely was like, I had this like deep black hole of like, I want to be rich, you know? So, you know, I had to, I had to fill the black hole. So anyways, I started a business, totally sucked, kind of stumbled through all these things, ended up starting an agency. And so when I started this agency, I did that for a whole year, like didn't get any clients. Totally just was awful at it. How old was so, I was probably 23 at this point. So I was just, I mean, and like there's 23 year olds are out there who like they start an agency and they're freaking successful. I was not one of those guys. I was like terrible. And uh, I was just really, really, really bad. And then so what happened was I joined this coaching program. It was four grand, but that was like an insurmountable money at the time. Yeah. So I joined this program and it's all these older women. I don't know. It was like the first program I saw, it was about an agent. So I just saw, joined. Mm-hmm. And you know, the, like every, I was the only young dude in that thing. It was all over women who were divorced. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so anyways, I'm in this program and they're all not good at sales. They were all really bad. Mm-hmm. I was just like an idiot. And I was like, okay, follow the directions of the program. I turned on the ads, the ads worked. And I started getting on the, I was taking like 10 sales calls a day. And I just like, I was honestly really bad, but I just had this, such a grit of like, oh, fuck it, I'll just take 10, 10 sales calls a day. Yeah. Then I started to close some people and I went from like zero and at the end of the eight weeks of the program, I did 56K. Wow. And so all these older women in this program were looking at me and they were like, this guy sucks at digital agency work. He's mm-hmm. not good at media. He's not good at any of these things. And they kept calling me like, you're just a sales guy. Like the reason you're successful, you're just so good at sales. Like, will you take my sales calls? And I, I was like, I'm not going to take your sales calls because I have, I have my business. But they were like, you're just a sales guy. Oh, I'm just, I'm just not as good at sales as Cole. So I'm early on in this entrepreneurial career. And, you know, when you're early on in anything that's new in life, you're kind of subconscious trying to figure out who you are. Right. Mm-hmm. So like they keep, you're the sales guy. So I kind of was like, oh, I'm good at sales. I was actually really bad at the time. But I'm okay. I'm good at sales. So Mm -hmm. what happened was with the agency, it was just too many skills at once. I was trying to learn. I felt felt like I was trying to learn seven different things. I was running out of money. I got down to my last thousand bucks. I was like, okay. I I knew the sales guys who would roll me into that program. And I knew they were making like 20 grand a month. So I was like, well, I'm just going to do that. That seems like so much easier. I can focus on one thing. After all, I am the sales guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just going to go do that. So I'm thinking I'm going to be so good at this thing. I get in, I'm literally the worst guy on the team for like six months. And that was when you you were talking with Wilson, he probably told you like, I, yeah, when I sold the Cole, he sucked. I mean, I really did. I really sucked for like a while. And it took me like six years. I mean, I was good enough to stay on the team, but I was like always one of the worst two guys. And it took me like six or seven months. And I don't know what it was. Well, I do know, do know what it was, but it's kind of what changed just grit, just figuring it out. To be honest. and And I feel bad saying this because I really like the guy who was my sales manager at the time. And I, I did learn a lot from him, but I think he was under so much pressure from the people who did the owner was like really micromanaging him. And since mm-hmm. I was one of the bottom two guys in the team, I was being like hyper micromanaged. And so mm-hmm. like he, they would listen to the calls as we were talking and like blow us up on Slack. And it was like, I, I could, I was just so in my head. So yeah. when he got fired, I literally went from the worst guy to the best guy in one month. Mm. And it was like all of this. Cause I was, tr- I was also like, and he would always tell me like, dude, you try harder than anybody. Like I was definitely putting in the training and I was investing in coaching. I had no money. I was like, I bought this coach for like 30 grand. It was like ridiculous. So you I, uh, coach back then. Yeah. His name was Stan Wed. I don't know if you know who he is. He's still, it was kind of like a he shifted around, but yeah, he was coaching me back then. And I mean, he helped me a ton. And I was getting, you know, the other dude was, was good too, to be honest. I think he was just, he was micromanaging me because he was getting micromanaged and he was under pressure about getting fired. So I was like, I was like, you know, so as soon as he went and there was some pressure release, 
and I could just kind of like be more natural. Mm -hmm. A lot of these things I had learned stopped being forced and started to just be like natural is the best way to put it. Cause I had been training freaking hard and putting in a ton of work. And so like, that was like, I think in March of that year. And I went from like the worst guy to the best guy. And then after that, I really never was not top two for the rest of the time I was there. Amazing. Um, and so Wilson, Wilson actually replaced the guy who got fired. So, um, but Wilson was a beast, but anyways, so I did that. And then, you know, as I got better, I kind of realized the same way, you know, if you, you know, if you listen to Hormozzi and he talks about opportunity vehicles and business. Well, with sales guys and gals, there's opportunity vehicles and sales, right? Like, and I realized it took me so long. Huh? What does that mean an opportunity vehicle? Well, in business, you know, like if you, uh, like for instance, let's say Hormozzi, for example, like he was selling the gyms and he had obviously an extremely successful life-changing business with that wealth building wise. But he wants to play at a level that can get to a billion. So now he's going to more private equity realm, right? That's just a, a higher scale opportunity vehicle. Yep. And helping you know a very small tam of broke gyms, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of just a like you know becoming a doctor is a lower opportunity vehicle than being a hedge fund manager. That's why if you ever heard the thing like rich dads tell their kids to be hedge fund managers, they tell their kids to be you know those types of things. Rather, rather as like poor dads are like, hey, go be a lawyer, cool. right? Because yeah. it's it's they, they don't understand the opportunity vehicles, whereas. A rich dad is, is seeing these all things. So he's like, go to the top. And so, uh, because it's all the same, you just got to put in the time to learn these things. It's all skills at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Skills and beliefs and all those things. So anyways, um, there's opportunity vehicles and sales. And I didn't realize this for the longest time. I just thought like, oh, I'm glad I have leads. I was being given leads and I was like, I'm being given leads. Like, this is awesome. You know, it, it took me a year. And when I started to network with other sales guys, I realized my leads were really bad. Mm. Let me give you an example. We would, I think they would take emails. And so our market was also 50 to 70 year old realtors. Yeah, it was a tough upwards of upwards of babies. So really hard to talk to. And I think personally, this is a theory, but I think they would just take the emails and just book them and schedule ones. Yeah. Yeah. So like, cause people would be showing up to the calls and maybe they were just old. They had no idea. Like, yeah. Who's this again? Like, you know, it was just like, like, and people would just hang up or they think I, I was, I mean, this was an inbound appointment. They would think I was cold calling. I just thought this is how it was. Yeah. So little do I know I'm being, I, I got really good with really bad leads. Yeah. And I didn't know what good leads were. That was like a gift, but it was honestly, it was brutal to go through. Right. And, and, and like, dude, like with, with a 65 year old real estate agent, mm -hmm. they're going to call you up or you're going to call them. And you think it's an inbound appointment. You know, you're going through us for Fina's training and marks and, and you're like, okay, like, uh, they're I'm, like they're gonna want to reach out to me. I'm the prize. If like, you're going through all these things, all that stuff goes out the window. When the 65 year old guy, I literally he oh, like, yeah, answers, yeah. and he's like, "What do you got? What's the price?" <laughs> you know. So you got to learn how like kind of engineer those things. And I really wasn't that good at it back then, but it it built me in a good way. Yeah. So then I kind of realized, and I see like all these other companies, and I'm like, "Oh my god, they have marketing!" Like I was like, "We don't have any of this stuff." Like if I had that, I'd be making three times as much money. So I kind of like started to check out and I quit. And the next company I went to sold an SEO coaching program, literally within like two weeks, I was like the best guy in the team and I was making more than I was making the other company. And I was like, okay, see, my theory was correct. Yeah. And then I, I and always in the back of my mind at the time, I, I was looking at traffic and funnels. I was like, man, their marketing is so good. Like I was like, I, could it just, is good. Yeah. I, was like, I could just, you know, and this was back in the day when the, the memos had just launched the, that webinar they had was like, that was like, that was their main thing. So that webinar was just pumping. I was like, dude, I need to go sell that thing. So eventually, you know, we happened to be in the same city and I got a cold uh, Peyton Taylor's brother. And then I went over there. And then with that, you know, the first 30 days, I, I think I was overthinking it. I just kind of sucked. Honestly, I just dropped the ball the first 30 days. I mean, I was okay. Good enough to stay on the team, but then Taylor, Taylor's a beast. He'll coach you up. He's, he's a beast. And, and to be honest, what happened was I just, I, I, I respected the company so much yeah. that I sort of like got in and I was learning all this stuff from all these new people. And I forgot, like, I already knew what I was doing. So yeah. I just had this epiphany, like, dude, you've done this like a thousand times. And just like do what you can do it. So I sort of like threw out the new process, went back to what I was doing. And then that was in the, that was the first day of December. And that month I was the top of the team and really was pretty much at the top 
throughout the entire thing just exploded. And we, we it was like me, me doing that and, you know, Pete exploded at the same time. That just exploded the company. So that was a really, really cool time. It was really fun. Grew a lot. Um, I always say with Taylor, like, um, you know, I think he reviewed two of my calls when I was there. Right. Was, uh, it was one yeah. of them, uh, you know, we had the sales mentor program together and uh, there was one of your call reviews, him reviewing your call in yeah, there. That was, that was one of the two. Yeah, it was good. One of the two. But what I always, the reason I say that is because a lot of the sales stuff I learned was going through, you know, I went through your training, I went through, you know, Jeremy's, I went through, I was, I literally, went, if anybody had a training, I just went through. Yeah, I think I had a lot person, of coaches. You're the only person I know that consumes more content than me. Like, I'm yeah. just, I love it. I like, I go for walks. I'm like, listen, it's like just playing all the time. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So you know, I was going through all this different training. What he really helped me with Taylor was like how to really dial in being high performer. Cause I didn't, I didn't really, I, I had kind of high standards, but I, I didn't really know what high standards were until I got there. And that really helped me uh, like take my talent and utilize it. Cause I kind of already had the talent. I didn't really need more sales stuff at that point. I needed to like know how to think. You know, so that helped me. That helped me tremendously. And then after that, I left, and you know, obviously did the companies, which is which is where I'm at now. Yeah. Speaking of that high performance, and I know it was good. It was different. I mean, I'm I'm from a high performance background with Tony. It's all it's all about that. But the training that I set in when I you know I met Taylor, we had a sales agency at the time, and somebody had connected me with him about possibly you know adding salespeople to his team. And I saw he shared shared with me the kind of the docs and the inner work. He shared with me everything. And I was like, you guys are way more advanced with what you're doing than we are. And so we just developed a friendship uh, there. And he invited me to come speak at the event in the Dominican. Uh, it was like you, Alaric, like everybody, Brian, who was there, yeah. Josh Harris. It was like all superstars there. And we created that partnership. Um, but speaking of energy management, yeah, Taylor's like a beast on all of that. It was different. It was eye-opening for me because it was different. Like what he taught really helped me a lot. And I was from that background. Yeah. Um, speaking of that for yourself, because you, you have so much going on. And I remember when, I remember being at TNF in Nashville, in Franklin, and you were like eating, like you had your food prepped. Uh, you had gotten up at like in the morning done, doing, you know, Brazilian, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. Like, and, and I know like your routines have kind of changed a bit now because you're oh, yeah. so busy, you just work. Um, what were your routines back there, back then and, and how they evolved? Over time. Yeah, this is a great question. I like talking about this stuff. So, so basically back then, and I will say this for, so for any sales guys listening, I do think rigidity in your routine was good in sales. Like I do think having that when I was a sales guy, that was good. I think it's for a few reasons. Number one is that you really can't, you know, it depends on your time zone a little bit, but I was central time. Oh. So most time zones, you really can't make a dent in sales to about 80. And that's early still. Right. So, the thing is, you know, the whole get up and start working thing doesn't really apply when you're a sales guy. What are you going to do? Get up at 5 a.m. and start calling people? I mean, you could, but I mean, you could send prospecting emails, I guess, but like, you know, it kind of doesn't work. So I woke up at five and immediately I would, you know, when, when I woke up, I'd be so like drowsy, right? You know, just, I think everybody is. So I would, you know, sip some caffeine. I'd always read a book because good inputs is good outputs, right? So I, I'd get some good energy in there and some good, and back then I always, I was just like to read like good self-development stuff, yeah. leadership, like straight line leadership is a great book. I mean, honestly, I wish I would have found that one in sales. Like I, I freaking just crushed that thing. So anyways, I would read for 30 minutes and then I would get up, I'd go to the gym and, you know, high intensity, some, something is high intensity every day. Cause I just felt like in, in sales wise, I had to get my energy up. Um, to get into the day. And I was not a afternoon or evening workout person. I wish I, I wish I am but I'm just not. So did that. And then afterwards I would do some sort of breath work and also meditation, which I found just kept me, if I didn't do that, I would get so mad. Like I would just get mad at prospects. I would get angry. I get patient. I wouldn't be able to really listen. So like I would Wim, do some sort of like Wim Hof Hof kind of meditation. Huh? Yeah. I, was, I was asking Wim Hof breathing. Is that the type? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That's good. I mean, breath of fire, Wim Hof, whatever. I think, I mean, it's good. I, I wish I wish it didn't work so well because um, it's kind of a pain in the ass to do, but it, it really did work, especially with that, that kind of workout combo deal. And then I would get into my day. You know, obviously I'd prepare for the meeting, hit the meeting, and then the rest of the day is just like trying to make money. So that was my routine back then. Now it's just so weird. Like, I, you know, it's it's a little bit all over the place, and a lot of it's because my days change. You know, some days. I will do, you know, like yesterday, like today, this is my only call. 
right? So I'm doing, I did a presentation all today, like I was, I was writing and, and making slides and shit. So like today was a creative day, but yesterday I just did 15 calls back to back to back to back to back. Because unlike a sales guy, I have to balance um, creating new stuff and deep work essentially with talking to a lot of people, right? So the only call I'll do on a Tuesday or Wednesday or Friday is maybe our, our main meetings, like our sales meeting or our team meeting, but I won't do like a bunch of one-on-ones. I, I save those all for Mondays and Thursdays. So a lot of it depends on that. Um, but I will say like, you know, I still, I, I wake up a little bit later now, like six, but I wake up usually naturally, which is, is nice. So I kind of get a full night's sleep no matter what. I get up, I still do that same thing where I just feel useless in the morning. So I basically just drink caffeine and read a book. But that, that anchor trigger, whatever, if I don't do that, I will not read. So I have to do that because if not, and if I do do it, I will read a ton. But if I don't do it, I won't read at all. Because once the day gets going, I'm not reading. Yeah. So I'll do that. And then usually, depending on you know what my workout schedule is, I might hit a workout right after that. Or I'll just go on a walk and I'll listen to, um, I, like, like you said, dude, I think I've literally listened to more marketing courses than anybody on earth. So I, I listen to some you know, audio book, whatever. So I get to kind of the reading and then I, I get the rest through... Um, you know, audio. Oh, yeah. And then after that, I'll, I'll do some meditation and, and start work. So it's kind of similar, but it's a lot more, I mean, I kind of, it's a lot more relaxed now. Yeah. And I have to do that because uh, I would legit burn out. Like, I mean, that, that routine I did have in sales, it is good. Like I do think having a good workout in, in the morning does help, but it, 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 it burned me out pretty bad. You know, yeah, so. when, when you broke off from your sales gig, and I, and I was there, I remember I, I talked to you before, you were going to do your own course and you did, it, you know, everybody said it was like really organized and, and just so well done. Had you been preparing that content that had you been carrying, creating like Google docs and notes on all of your processes for years? Cause it was like, it's a lot of stuff. Like, and you just came out with it and you had this amazing course and people like Frank Kern went through it, you know, all these yeah. things like had gone through your course. And yeah. it was like, I, I heard from some of these people and they said it was just like so much stuff. That, I mean, how had you been just collecting all that data for a long time? Well, so so for the the sales side, yes, but I, I never had dude. I never had the intention of doing the sales course thing. Like I I really never did. Um, but what happened was, yeah, I like I basically when I was selling full time, I mean, I always kind of document what I was doing because I got to a process where I like I wasn't using honestly. I never used the company process. I kind of like had this living organism of Google Docs that I sort of kept with me. I never with the intention to teach it really, but more just like, you know, I would go through a Kevin Nation's training. I go through your training. I mean, I was documenting all these things I was learning and assimilating it. And then I learned some of my own stuff. Right. And so I would kind of like assimilate it all into like a messy Google Doc. Right. Mm -hmm. It was like this big doc. Right. And so I had that, which helped. And then, um, what I will say is what really helped me is like, remember I started an agency way back when. So I was never just this like sales guy. Like I was a kind of like entrepreneurial first. Mm -hmm. And so I was going through, you know, Sam Evans and all these different courses way back in 2016. And so, and I never stopped, you know, mm -hmm. even, even when I was in sales, eventually like I got to a point where I was like, dude, I don't really know how to get better. Like I was like, I, I am sure there's ways I can get better, but I was like, this one-on-one -on -one call selling this product, I was like, I literally think I maxed this thing out. Like, I don't know how I can sell more than I'm selling. So I started to go through copywriting and I started to go through, you know, different programs and learning different things. And so when I, I think the thing people don't realize is when I left, I, I had the sales skill, but also I think people forgot, like I had an agency, I ran ads, I knew how to buy media. I knew how to write copy. I've been going through copywriting training. So like I had a lot of these, I didn't just start with sales because like normal sales guy trying to do their own thing, they're just sales. And then they got to start building skill by skill by skill. Yeah. Copywriting, they got to build this. But the, I had probably the, the marketing and the, and the sales down. That was about it. And a little bit of fulfillment because I, you know, I had at least been a part of a company that had decent fulfillment. So I kind of understood how to do the fulfillment. I kind of understood how to pay sales, copy. So that really exploded me to like 100 grand a month just immediately. You know, it's because I had a lot of these skills.
Yeah, the copy is so good that you put out. Copy is copy is important. It inter- helps you understand like attention, yeah. and psychology. What would have been some of your favorite uh, courses or books on copywriting that have helped you? I mean, there's a lot. So, I mean, the, the 16 word sales letter, "Take Their Money" by Kyle Milligan is good. "Ready Fire Aim" is more of a business book, but it's 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 also very good. "Great Leads" is the classic. Um, yeah. You have to go through that one. Uh, "How to Be Persuasive" by Mark. Anything by the Agora kind of family is where is where you want to start um if you can ever find anything by perry bocher he's very good uh well, i have them on i had uh kevin nations on the other day and they're like best buddies perry's gonna be on the show oh yeah but he's, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he, he, he's a brilliant guy so yeah i went through a lot of that stuff i mean great leads was the really the one that helped me a lot that one was one where i read it and i immediately got a lot better because i just was like oh okay i know what i'm doing now yeah. and so so yeah, I mean, I, and I feel like, am I the best copywriter? I mean, I'm not a professional copywriter, no. but I am pretty good at writing copy for my thing. You yeah, know? I understand your thing. When it comes to the couple products I sell, I know, I know how to do it. And I can do it most better than most copywriters can because it kind of takes a while to sort of learn mm-hmm. to fix, you know? And you got to talk to your market. You got to know your market. A lot of this is empathy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you got to put it in the right structure. So. Yeah, that, that helped me a lot and uh, had a lot of good lessons there. And they all carry over to sales. Like a lot of them are, the, are very similar in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, you've, you've grown so fast, so quick and been so successful. But if you had to do over again, are, is there anything you would do differently to get to this point you are now? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, you know, you could say certain things like, um, you know, when I started, I just did sales training. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this thing for sales team training. And then I was like, then I finally was like, okay, I'm going to do the sales recruiting. And that was just because I was literally getting asked. And I know you, you know, you get this as well, yeah. but I was getting asked every day. And you know, do you know where I can find good salespeople? Then I started connecting these people and I was like, well, I'm not getting paid for this. <laughs> and I was like, well, I should probably find a way to get paid. And so I never really thought when I started to do the sales recruiting, that it would be as what it is now. Mm-hmm. I, I never thought that. I thought that what was, I thought the thing that was going to scale was the B2C, which it did. But, uh, man, the B2B just was, I had a lot of limiting beliefs around it for some reason. Yeah. So anyways, I mean, once, once we kind of broke through a few of my limiting beliefs, I was like, oh, okay, well, this could just, you know, there, there's, there's a huge ceiling for this. I was like, I'm, I'm stupid. So, um, you know, if I, I guess you could say, oh, I could have gotten into the sales recruiting earlier, then we'd be six months ahead. But I don't know, man. I kind of like the natural learning process that I had. I don't regret it. Um, mm-hmm. There's definitely a lot of things when you're building teams you know, there's a lot of people where you're like, oh man, like I made some stupid people mistakes. I hired the wrong person. We don't have a lot of that, but I mean, anybody does. Anybody's went through bad hires or, you know, paid somebody too much or like somebody's, you know, just didn't lead somebody the right way. So there's little things like that. But I don't know if there's anything huge. Yeah. My, my main focus is like kind of the speaker training now. And that was your advice to me to create kind of recruitment thing. So we're, we're looking at that too, because I've yeah. seen people do it and not that effectively. Um, and a lot of people are doing the thing like get booked on stages type stuff. So, and not, not that well, and I've got so many contacts. So we're, we're looking at that probably not till the end of the year, but um, I did want to ask you this, you share with me the story and I'll say it, you invented the two-step. So tell me about <laughs> that day. Like, how did that come to be? Because it's, you know, I, I put out a two-step today uh, and I didn't even know what one was till, you know, shortly after we met. Uh, yeah. what, what is the two-step for everybody here? And like, what was this process? Well, everybody's going to know it because it's like the post where it's like, comment below if you want the thing and everybody comments and then yeah. your setters reach out. So here's what I'll say. Some people were doing the comment belows. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't invent the, hey, comment below, right? Like, I, I don't know who invented that, but that probably was around for a while. What I will say, I was the first one to do for sure, which is the real way you make money out of it, is follow up with your setters. Like nobody, I don't know, it kind of seems like pretty simple, but I know nobody in my industry was doing it um, until we started doing it. And so what happened was, we were on the sales meeting and um, Taylor was just, I was branded. Oh, it was my first day. It was maybe my second day, first or second day. Thursday or, it was a Thursday or a Friday. And uh, he's just, it, it was the old sales team because basically there was a few stragglers on and then they fired him. So he's just laying into these guys about how, um, you know, like 
just you know they're not performing or whatever and then he's like there's but there, there was no calls on the calendar because the marketing wasn't working and he's like dude there's so much opportunity just he just kind of pulls up the facebook he's like go connect to the people with the facebook group he's like kind of pull some stuff up and there's a bunch of comments he's like reach out to these people and i was just like sitting there i'm like the day one and uh what had happened was the program i sold that first program we sold to real estate agents mm-hmm. we, we were teaching this linkedin outreach thing yeah. Okay. So I knew this, this link, this outreach strategy. And I was like, Oh, there's people who want this thing. Right. And so everybody was kind of like given, you know, the few people who would try it, it would like give them the PDF that they're asking for. And then like really have these lame follow-up questions. So what I did is I took this cold messenger strategy mm-hmm. and I sort of like blended it into this two-step thing. And the first day and I had to make some adjustments. But the first day I booked, um, I think it was 17 sales calls. Wow. Which, dude, I'm a sales rep that's been on the team for two days. Mm-hmm. Right? And like, I remember Mitchell, who's on my team now, was like, you booked 17 sales calls? And what's funny is that because I didn't know how to like put them in the system, Mitchell canceled them. So yeah. I had to put them back on the system, which kind of pissed me off. But anyways, I remember being in the next meeting and they were like, you guys need to learn whatever this guy needs to do. So I just taught him what I was doing. And you know, is it, it wasn't really that crazy of a process, but when you're the first person to do something like that, yeah. like the results, we, 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 we only did that for months because it was working so well. But then obviously what happened was I made a video and taught it to the mastermind and then everybody started doing it and it freaking kind of really did for everybody. Yeah. So, I mean, it would have gotten out anyways, but uh, that, is the, that is the history of the two-step. There you go. Um, I wanted to ask you this, like you're, you, you become successful. What do you think has been different about you? Like your psychology and sales that's allowed you to excel the way you have obviously hard work that's been there and you're a student and you're digging into everything. What else has been something really beneficial? And I know people listening to this, there'll be some salespeople listening to this. Um, if somebody's starting out and they wanted to kind of model your beliefs, your mental syntax of how you do things, not just tactically, I say this, I don't say that, I handle this objection with these words. Like what is the psychology that somebody would need to get to your level, if possible? Well, do you, do you, you want to be successful in sales or for the business side? Because the sales business, first and then okay. business. Yeah. The business side is a, you like the response. Um, so for, I was, when you were asking this question, I was thinking about the, let's do the business side first. Cause when you're asking it, that's what I was thinking about. So here's the thing. When I started, there's, I mean, you know, the, there's a lot of sales trainers out there and, and look, I, I had, let, let me preface this by saying I had full belief in my product. I thought my product was the best. And I was like, this will really freaking help people. I think it's the, it's the best, right? So product wise, sales training wise, sales abilities wise, that is all there, right? However, my mindset going into the business side, I've not talked about this a lot, is I kind of looked at the other sales trainers of the market and I was like, I'm probably, you know, look, I think my, my stuff's really good. I think it's the best. However, I, it's going to be hard for me to compete with everybody else and really stand out and be a breakaway success if I try, try to compete on just the sales. Mm-hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go where they're not going and I'm going to become the best. At, I want to be the best sales trainer at copy. I'm going to buy all my own media and I'm going to become the best at systems, fulfillment, and leadership. Mm. And so what I did is instead of kind of focusing on what everybody was focusing on, I focused on all these other tertiary things that are really the skills of like a business owner, you know, mm. and that's what allowed to kind of like break away and, and offers and different stuff like that. So that's kind of how I thought about it because I knew I was already really good at sales. I was like, I, dude, because the thing is when you really get into sales training, some of your students are probably really advanced, but like most of the people we train, dude, I realized real fast, oh, okay, well, I'm just training beginners. I mean, but if you, if you do it at scale, you're training beginners. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, in advance, people do love our training too. But like, I, I had to really kind of dumb down, not dumb down, but like, can, uh, can collapse some things because I'm like, dude, like I'm training some people who are just getting started. And that's where you're really making the biggest impact anyways. So I was like, dude, I don't need to become a better sales trainer. I need to become a better, like, first of all, marketer to get this in the right people's hands. Uh, team got to get you know me out of this. I got to understand systems. I got to understand finance. 
So I really try to build those skills and I do miss, like I try to, that's why we were talking about my own stuff. You know, I do try to go back in there and still learn the sales stuff because I love it so much. But that was the biggest thing I think with the business stuff is that, and then I also realized that it's hard to sell sales training, but people, you know, had to repackage these things in all different ways. So people don't want to buy, you know, everybody's good at sales. It's just the leads, mm -hmm. right? But what people want is they want a sales rep. Right? <laughs> so I had to find a way to sell my sales training through that vehicle. Uh, the other thing is too, is like, people don't want to be good at, they, nobody wants to be a salesperson. Sales is like the military of business. Yeah. You know, it's like, people are like, oh, I'm getting into sales. You know, it's like, it's like they're going to the military of business, right? But what people do want to do is make money online. So I kind of got to take sales and repackage it into this way to make money online. You know, so every time, I, I, and, and that's hard. Like it's much easier to sell cryptocurrency training. I, I will tell you straight up because people already want it, right? It's like a direct demand to desire. You know, I have to kind of take the existing desire and through a chain of beliefs, channel it into demand to my product. That's that's not out there existing. If you look at keywords, so everybody thinks high ticket closings is big industry um, and this big like. Oh, it's such a good offer. I'm like, dude, look at keyword search volume on Google of high ticket closing. And then look at Amazon FBA. One's going to go like this. And the other one's going to be like this. You, wow. you tell me that my market's good. <laughs> I mean, I just found a way to take an existing desire and channel it into the right product. That's why in my marketing, you don't see me talking about high ticket closing. I talk about all the things they can get as a high product to that without the things they hate. So um, that's on the business side, on the sales side. I don't know, man. I mean, I think that, um, I think, I, I think I just really actively, um, it, a lot of it was just a massive, massive amount of fucking effort. Like no. I just, I just optimized my whole day around becoming good at one thing. You know, so if you you know, bills, that's what you would tell them to do. Just focus on one thing. Well, I mean, it's, it's, that's pretty, it's like a pretty vague piece of advice. But um, let, let me give an example. Because when I got in, I was trying to do all these skills. The real appeal to me is like, dude, I could drop all these business owner skills and I could just focus on one thing, right? So I did that. And like, I wasn't just taking the calls, but every call I was always trying to feel like, what could I have gotten better at that? Like, what could I have done better at that call? And what could I improve the next call? And I do see too many, the really good sales guys, they're like so passionate about finding any way they can get better at all. Right. Mm -hmm. The people who are kind of just mediocre, they do it as a job, not mm -hmm. a passion. Right. So you gotta, you gotta shift it into a passion. So what that looks like is like in the mornings when I worked out, I didn't say this in my morning routine, but I would review, I would listen to my sales calls and I would review wins every single day. Then in the mm -hmm. evenings I'd break down losses. Right. And I'm not saying I would just do that a couple of times, literally every single day, like every mm -hmm. single that helps a lot. Just condition yourself. I listen to training. I mean, you know, my information diet was just a training on new stuff. Any, anybody who I thought was good, I thought they're training. Even if I thought I went through some of it before, I'd buy it, right? Mm -hmm. Hiring a ton of coaches, all of that stuff. And so there was all of that. And then I was just so like, any feedback I could get, I'm like, oh, please give me feedback. Like, I just, you know, I was, it was just such a conscious, like, development effort to try to get better at that. And I just tried to keep there being a, like, keep the feedback loop going. And that, and that sounds so simple, but I just think like, I, you know, I've trained a lot of salespeople and I just think that there's so many that, uh, they kind of just do it. They, they go through the motions, you know, they play the notes, but they don't play the music. So, um, you know, that, that would be my biggest piece of advice. I could give some tactical sales training stuff. But, you know. Yeah. Well, I know you guys here. I know it's eight thirty your time, time to get stretched up. So <laughs> this been, man, it's always great just to, to talk and wrap with you and I'll, uh, I'll be out there in about a month. And so we'll have to, we'll have to kick it out. We'll, we'll link up, man. We'll get dinner. Yeah. Awesome, brother. Appreciate you. And now uh, where can people find out more about you? Uh, yeah. I mean, either, uh, you know, Instagram is Cole Thomas Gordon or uh, Facebook is cool.gordon.714. So, or closers.io. Closers.io is probably the easiest one. There you go. Awesome, brother. I'll be talking to you soon. And uh, thank you so much. Likewise, man.